it can't be like that. Like everybody's got to work together, right? Like that's, that's what DevOps is. DevOps is people, it's process, it's having an end goal for what your software is supposed to look like for your end users, right? right. And, and that's really, really what it comes down to. Um, the one thing that I wanted to bring up too, going back is that like when you said about DevNet, right? All right. Well, hey, friends. Good morning. Cloud Bart here. Just kind of spending a few minutes thinking a little bit about cloud computing and DevOps this week. Um, as you might imagine, in the world of cloud computing and technology, there is a lot of overlap in terminology and concepts. And so I thought uh, maybe over the next couple of weeks and months, we could be uh, focusing on DevOps a little bit throughout our time together. And so to kind of get us started this morning, I invited a friend of mine, uh, Michael Levon on. And Michael, you out there, buddy? What's up, man? How's it going? Oh, uh, I'm feeling cloudy. How about yourself? <laughs> Same. Um, And Michael is a cloud computing DevOps professional out there in the world as well. And so um, wanted to bring him on and hear us chat a little bit about uh, cloud computing this morning and the DevOps overlap. So what do you think, Michael? Maybe you could just give us a quick pitch about where you came from. um, And then can you help me understand here? Did cloud create DevOps? Did DevOps create cloud? What do you think? Yeah, sure. So my background in short is, you know, started off as a sysadmin infrastructure, moved over to development, uh, writing a ton of code in Python, API, stuff like that, then moved into DevOps, which was a natural progression uh, in today's world, right? So, you know, it, it's it's a funny question. In terms of did cloud create DevOps, you know, absolutely not. I mean, we've been practicing DevOps without it being called DevOps for years now, way before the word was coined in 2008 or 2009, whatever year it was. Um, I, I think that what we're seeing right now is DevOps and cloud are kind of getting popular at the same time. And that's kind of where people are making the comparison, right? Um, Not to mention, you know, we have all these vendors that are saying, hey, we're cloud and hey, we're doing DevOps. And it's just, you know, putting the marketing words out there a little bit more. That's that's really what it comes down to and why people think, you know, hey, cloud is DevOps or cloud equals DevOps or vice versa. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you too. I definitely see the timelines, um, kind of very similar pieces there. Um, I think the interesting thing for me with cloud computing is that there are certainly many technologies to it. Um, but I try really hard to not get people thinking about it as a technology itself. It's uh, it's a managed service offering. It's a vendor enablement sort of model behind it. Uh, and I feel like DevOps has a lot of that too as well. I, I even have a buddy in DevOps who used to joke about how people would come to him and say, can we buy a DevOps? Does it come in purple? <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think that's exactly the same story with cloud. People are like, can we buy a cloud? We would like a cloud. What's that look like? How much does it cost to buy one? <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so I think there's a little bit of that that happens there as well, where people misunderstand the concept versus the technology tooling part of it. So do you see some of that as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, I think it's very much because of the way it's marketed and sold, right? Of where it's, you know, hey, you don't have to have these beefy servers and you don't have to spend thousands of dollars anymore and pay for these electric bills. You can just easily sign up for this three month or 12 month free trial and get started right away. And it's not the case. It's not, it's not how it works. And I, sure. and I think that that's really what it comes down to. Um, and it is easier, right? Like it is easier to create a virtual machine in AWS or Azure versus having to go out, buy a server, put ESXi on it, configure it, then create a virtual machine. Oh, wait, I have to copy my ISO over. Okay, now I can do it. So it's definitely easier, but it's not, you know, like a one, two, three thing. Um, And then when it is a one, two, three thing, that's when you start to, you know, go into clients and say, oh, hey, your security group rule is open to the world and everybody can see your internal Jira server, right? Well, we <laughs> so, saw this tutorial we found online. I thought that'd be fine. <laughs> yep. No, that's exactly it. Uh, and, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, anything against anybody. It's just what we're told. We're told like, hey, it's so easy. And then once you get into it, you realize it's actually not that easy. Um <laughs> You know, you still need like those infrastructure principles, what compute is, what network is, what storage is, what firewall rules are, what VPNs are, what networks are in general, right? Like you still need all of that moving into the cloud. And then if you don't have it, hopefully you can get somebody that does have it because you're going to find yourself into some big trouble if you don't. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I know I have I love tools. That's part of what I love about technology is getting the tools, building the crazy stuff with it. Um 
But again, with cloud computing, I get a lot of misconceptions about buying the tool must mean we're enabling ourselves as a cloud organization. And I got to kibosh that pretty quickly because in a lot of ways, it, your process and your people and your culture parts, they're not just going to get upskilled by buying a new tool. And I think that is possibly the more difficult, immovable object <laughs> when we try to get people to think about really the transformation. Because like we said, we've been buying tools for years. You, you put it exactly right. A lot of the tooling is old. Um, scripting, source control, testing, automation, all those things have been around a long time. And so focusing on that cultural piece, that is much more difficult. And it requires a more holistic buy-in from the teams than just going and selecting a new tool. So I, I feel like there's got to be some of that that maybe is at work here as well. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I'm even, I, I can even say it's 80% of it. Like 80% of it is the people, the culture, the process, what the application and the environment looks like today, right? If you if you have an application and you can't ship it properly or you can't ship it without having 100 bugs or one feature fixing another part or breaking another part of the code, you're just, if you implement things like containers and Kubernetes and cloud and all of this stuff, you're just going to make it worse. Like it's just going to be 10 times worse than when you didn't have any of those things. Um, those, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you're building a house, right? And somebody gives you a hammer and some nails, you know, and it's like, who built the house, the hammer and the nails or the person, the person did they just had the tools to do it. And, and that's really what it comes down to. You know, you can't build a house if you don't know how to build a house with just some tools, right? And it's the same exact thing in technology. Um, you know, you can't just lift and shift something or you can't just throw an application in a container and say, yep, we're doing DevOps now. It can't work that way. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Sticking feathers up your butt does not make you a chicken necessarily. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm a cloudy chicken now. I got all the I got all the tools I needed. Yeah. It's true. And that you know that what that does though is when we don't approach it with that mentality, we threaten the value proposition. Of course. And and let's face it, us IT folks, we've been kind of missing what the business was doing for a long time. And I think that's why people say things like the cloud is taking our jobs and, you know, silly sentiments like that is like, come on, man, you guys were here to support the business in the first place. If this is the best, most efficient path for the business to take, then we should be supporting them in that endeavor, not sandbagging it with all of these other, uh, you know, concerns that may or may not be fabricated or real yeah no exactly i mean and i and i actually still see that now like i i was reading i forget what forum i was reading a post on the other day where somebody somebody said and this was recently like hey i'm not moving things to code because i don't want to lose my job oh yeah if if yeah, anything <laughs> if anything you are securing your job if you learn how to write code if you learn what source control is what git flow is what the cloud is how to make all these things work together you are securing your job, right? You know, let's say you're used to manually clicking next, next, next to create a virtual machine, right? Yeah, maybe you're not doing that anymore, but guess what? You're maintaining the source control, you're maintaining the repository, you're maintaining the code, you're testing the code, you're deploying the code, you just ranked up like three or four more roles in your job <laughs> that you have to yeah, do. All that life cycle management still has to be considered. Ex exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, then you can get into things like, well, hey, my code deploys, but do I want to implement some testing? Do I want to implement some continuous monitoring? Where do I want the code to go? Um, you know, so there's there's so many different things that you can bring in and implement right now. Um, and from a technology perspective, like it's just fun, right? Like it's not fun to click buttons. It's not. I hate it. I, I if if it's if it's something super simple, like unless it's like I have to look at a monitor, I can't stand being in a UI. I love either being in a terminal or being in VS Code or right and writing code. That's what I like. It's just more fun. You know, you see it. You're building it up, you know, you're building it from scratch, essentially, you know, and that's what makes yeah. it more fun. So it keeps you interested. It keeps you intrigued. It keeps you learning, keeps your brain going. That's, you know, that's what it's all about. Oh, yeah, man, that's that's something that keeps me excited about it now and onto the horizon here as well. Right. Um, you know, and I cannot help but look at the Cisco world as we bring up some of these topics and look at what the DevNet world and <laughs> yeah. the world of network automation has done to traditional operations roles. Um, and I got to say, it is all DevOps as far as I'm concerned. 
I don't think of DevOps as CI CD. What I typically tell people is that it's targeted automation. That's that's what it's all about. It's about pr providing predictability, uh, reproducibility, consistency, improving efficiency. Um, yep. And yes, CI CDs are one of the most interesting looking flavors of that. Right. Um, but I think that the DevNet automation pieces they're seeing right that those are DevOps principles. You are still using code to drive changes in traditional infrastructure. And that is a very powerful principle. So I think anybody getting into the space, you might not have thought of it as DevOps as you began your network automation career, but that is really kind of the umbrella that we're all beginning to sit underneath here. And that's, I think for me, part of why I see those two interacting uh, and overlapping so much. DevOps teams who are very um, savvy are often cloud enabled and teams that are cloud enabled are almost invariably going to be DevOps savvy as well. Um, oh, yeah. I think from a career perspective, that's a very uh, important part. And I guess the last question I wanted to kind of ask on that front was, um, when I think about traditional job roles, I a lot of people are like, I was a sysadmin before, therefore I will become a cloud sysadmin. Okay, well, like I put cloud in front of my job title. <laughs> like, <laughs> while that is exactly what a lot of the world's hiring departments are doing, that is a really lost cause for a lot of people who are in the job field trying to understand what the work is compared to the role and the training and the exams that they're supposed to acquire to help <laughs> marry up those three. <laughs> so what do you think? Do we have systems administration still? Do we have those classic titles? Are they really all cloud engineers now? Are they all DevOps engineers? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really going to depend on the organization, right? So I either I see one of two things pretty much happening. One is organizations are like making DevOps just sysadmin 2.0, right? Where you're you're still managing infrastructure, you're still doing all of those things, except you're doing it in an automated fashion now, right? So where you would create a bunch of virtual machines manually, you're now, you know, sprinkling a little bit of DevOps on it and writing it some Terraform or some cloud formation, using Ansible for some configuration management, putting that code in source, uh, that code in source control, uh, deploying it in a cloud. And then before you know it, it's stacking up and then it's becoming, you know, what DevOps is. Um, the other thing that I see, and that, that's like more of in a small organization. Now, the other thing that I'm seeing is in large organizations, they're taking what we knew of IT, right? And that's kind of moving more towards like desktop support and imaging and maybe like uh, Windows System Center management, all of that stuff, right? And then they're creating new departments for cloud engineering and DevOps. Um, you know, for example, Sophos, they, they have like a specific department for cloud engineering and DevOps, but they're in one. Right. And then they have IT separate um, other yeah. organizations that I've been in, you know, they're you know, they're, they have like IT right where they're doing desktop support and answering tickets and stuff. But they also have access to Azure if they need to create a virtual machine or manage the network or something like that. So it's really going to depend like on what the organization is, how large the organization is and ultimately how mature the organization is. Oh, yeah. And that's a great example. Now, Sophos is a highly technical organization that right. has um, an interest in service management for their managed products and then also their internal operational pieces, too. So I'm sure when you get into service management organizations, you would see more isolation. But we want to be careful, though, right, because any of those isolation techniques are going to be problematic in most DevOps environments. Breaking silos down is one of the key principles. So we want to be careful with that because... And I guarantee you talk to some of the Sophos people, there's probably some business logic behind why they keep some of that separate. Right, um, right. You know, and that goes back to our, our support the business. Right. So I, I think a lot of it, at least in my opinion, comes down to ownership, right? So the, breaking the silos, right? It's, you know, can front end work with back end? Can back end work with infrastructure? Can infrastructure work with QA people? Like it's, it's really about getting everybody in the same room and having the same end goal, right? Um, in terms of like department segregation, it would be nice if we didn't see that, but I think we're always going to see that because there has to be ownership, right? So if there's an Azure environment, right, and we put everybody together and there's 500 engineers because all the teams are together now. and oh, That sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then and it's like who owns what who's leading what you know so it's it, i think that's really what it comes down to it it comes down to more of like from a business perspective of it's very hard to 
provide ownership on who's doing what if everybody's just here right now on the flip side though like you said there can't be silos right like you have to all work with each other like the devs can't throw code over the fence uh the infrastructure people can't say your code sucks fix it it can't be like that like everybody's got to work together right like that's that's what devops is devops is people it's process it's having an end goal for what your software is supposed to look like for your end users. Right. And, and that's really, really what it comes down to. Um, the one thing that I wanted to bring up too, going back is that like when you said about DevNet, right, we're seeing the whole world changing right now from a tech perspective. Like I would have never thought in my career that I would see a Cisco networking certification have a section for source control. <laughs> who would have known yeah. that? Like who, who would have assumed that? Or a that, major right? programmatic language that they have to learn to. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's very heavy in Python right now too. A lot yeah. of Cisco stuff, like when they're talking about programming and automation, it's real heavy in Python. It's real heavy in Ansible, right? Like it's, it's shifting, right? I mean, you, you would have never guessed, you know what I mean? Like it's, you would have never seen that happen. I mean, like even with like DevOps and stuff and, and automation, and all that, like, you could see, hey, yeah, this is a little bit easier to do a thing this way, right? But I, I would have never guessed Cisco, you know, for networking. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, kudos to them for, for staying oh, yeah. on it, though, because oh, I don't yeah. see them as being viable in the future without really supreme automation features like this. APIs, absolutely. Scriptability, absolutely. Yep. Uh, programmatic uh, solutions, for sure. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, even like when it comes to virtual networking and like Azure AWS, right? Like, it sucks if you have to manually do all that. If you have to set up a VPC, you have to set up a gateway, you have to set up several subnets. Oh, what subnet is public? Which one's private? You and don't want to do that prone. manually. Exactly. And super error prone. I can't tell you how many times I've click, clicked the wrong button or put the uh, 25 instead of a 24. Four times. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, it, it's true. So it's it's we're really seeing like the world changing, right? And everybody's starting to adopt DevOps. Um, and I think the, the thing that everybody needs to be careful of is don't adopt it just because the technology looks cool. Adopt it because you have a business specific value that you want to continuously provide value to your end users, right? Like you have a goal in mind. That's what you want to do. Um, don't just do it because the Kubernetes looks cool, right? Like I could, I could have the same speed in an application, you know, deploying to a container that I could to a virtual machine as well. That's not going to, that's not going to change the speed or the quality, right? Um, it just makes things a little bit easier in some cases. So just, you know, make sure that when you're, implementing a technology you're doing it for the right reasons you know that's kind of like what i tell everybody um you know clients that i work with uh, people that you know students people that read my posts all that stuff it's i always push the fact of like make sure that you still have quality engineering in mind it's the biggest part i love it michael and you know that last piece there um kind of brings it back around to as a career person looking to get into the devops space um hopefully we know a little more about what that looks like um, and also the relationship between this other big change, which is cloud enablement, whether that be internal clouds or publicly hosted clouds, um, they're all driven by a lot of the same core technologies, virtualization, automation, and networking. So this means that even if you think you're getting into DevOps or you're getting into the cloud, you're getting into those three technologies and the workloads that are enabled by them in the end. So this is where I think as a career person that Yes, put DevOps on your portfolio and on your direction, but keep in mind all the other supporting technologies that are going to enable you to be a powerful player on the DevOps team and break silos down. Because that is really, I think, the magical thing here is that you don't, not everybody can be a cloud champion or a DevOps champion and stand in the business and technical worlds right. or operations and development worlds and marry those things together. So people who can do that from a soft skill and a technical skills perspective, they're going to be very, very lucrative in the DevOps world. Oh, yeah. I really, uh, really think so. No, I definitely agree. And, you know, the soft skills part is a very, very big chunk of it, right? Yeah. Like, here's the thing. I mean, anybody could learn technology, right? Like, anybody can go through a training or watch some videos and learn it to a certain degree, right? But yeah. if you can't explain why you need to do a thing to somebody or why they need to give you five hundred thousand dollars to do a thing you're, that thing's not going to happen yeah. <laughs> so, gotta garner that buy-in exactly that is a soft skills piece yeah yeah yep. that's that's the biggest part 
Oh, man. Michael, I could sit here and chat DevOps with you all day, buddy. I really appreciate you spending a few minutes with me. Um, uh, if there was one thing that you would leave my, our DevOps viewers with, um, any little tidbits before we sign off? Yeah, absolutely. I would say the biggest thing, I mean, and I kind of mentioned it before, is if you're going to be implementing something right, just make sure you're doing it with quality engineering in mind. You know, don't don't make something go fast just for the sake of it going fast and it failing 99 times out of 100 times, right? It's not going to do anything for you. Just keep the quality engineering in mind. Think about it. Go slow. Go at a fast, fast pace. You know, you, you're not going to lose any time. Just make sure that if you implement something, you implement it the right way. That's all. And I, it's sometimes it's easier said than done, depending on the team, depending on the organization. But that should be your biggest focus is how can I implement this in a way that it's not going to break everything. <laughs> Now, or uh, failing gracefully is right. another big yeah. principle there too. Uh, planning exactly. for failure. I know that that's, right. that's the classic AWS mantra there is everything fails all the time. So it's not a question of what do we do when it fails, but we need to plan and assume it could fail at any time. And that's how we design for it. But you're right. That, what is it? The classic one is proper planning prevents patentedly poor performance. <laughs> yep. There you go. And, and even another thing too is uh, this is a think it's a, a product management term where it's like you can have fast easy or cheap pick two oh, yeah the three constraints yeah. yeah exactly like you can't have it all <laughs> so <laughs> that's what it comes down to that's awesome well michael i really appreciate you taking some time here buddy um i'm we're gonna be hearing a lot more from the devops conversations here um in the future and i can't wait to chat with you a little bit more buddy absolutely have a great man. time and we'll see you in the cloud thank you so much see you <laughs>